Yeah, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and to speak on an issue which is of utmost importance for German industry. Uh, you probably know, as you already referred to, that exports make about 46% of our GDP. And you probably don't know that imports make for another 38%. So we are left with a foreign trade quota well beyond 80%. Just to compare, in the case of France, it's 45%. In the case of the US, uh, US, it's 25%, as far as I remember. So we are... We are very open, very globalized, uh, but also very exposed. Uh, I think this will get underlined also by investment. Uh, we have uh, more than 36,000 companies having invested more than 1 trillion euro um, uh, abroad. So as I said, um, very much globalized, uh, but very much exposed as well. So we follow the tendencies, the protectionist tendencies, with very great concern. Uh, and uh, to be clear on that, we rightly are these days preempted with um, um, the protectionist rhetoric and the measures taken by Trump, uh, but he's not the only one um, who resorts uh, to protectionism. Uh, since uh, 2008, when uh, the G20 countries committed themselves to keep the markets open, we could count for more than 2,500 trade restrictive measures. Some of them have take, been taken back, but still many of them are, are in place. So you look to China, where we I think are still exposed to major hurdles to market access. Uh, we have a strong pressure on uh, localizing production in Brussels and Russia and many other places. Um, we have, uh, of course, Brexit um, in, in, in the European Union, where the British government interpreted it in a way that they have to leave the single market. And, of course, we have also very strong resistance against the trade um, transatlantic trade and investment uh, partner uh, partnership in Germany. Very strong demonstrations on, uh, against that. So I think we have to look at the reasons for that and, 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 and see how we can deal with this. And I think there are, from my point of view, two very obvious reasons. One was already addressed in um, the session yesterday by Uwe Dadusch, um, as far as I remember, uh, saying that, of course, we had a decline of social inequality globally but we had an increase of social inequality in many major economies. And those people who feel left behind or think their jobs get lost to emerging economies want the jobs get back. Uh, I think we can argue here for a while whether the job losses are due to technological change or to globalization, but at the end, from my point of view, here it's clearly the responsibility of national governments to deal with these problems, um, to create uh, social safety nets, uh, to support those who lost their jobs in uh, retraining and uh, lifelong uh, learning, but also to invest in innovation um, and, uh, and research. The second reason, uh, clearly, for uh, protectionism, rising protectionism, I think is the sentiment of governments and societies that they're lose control over unleashed global market forces. Uh, this was certainly reinforced by the financial market crisis. Uh, where it was interpreted by these kind of unleashed uh, capital markets, which uh, caused the problem. And so the, the question is how to regain it. And um, it is uh, Danny Roderick who uh, phrased this um, globalization trilemma, said that, which says that you can't have hyperglobalization, as he called it, democratic politics and national sovereignty at the same time. Uh, either you, have to, you can always uh, combine two of them. Um, quite obviously, most of the governments opted for the option to reinforce national sovereignty over globalization. I think this is very understandable, uh, as uh, first uh, it serves or addresses populist sentiments you have. Secondly, you have well-established instruments and policies to do so. And of course, it strengthens national governments and in some cases, authoritarian rule. So it's, I think it's understandable that they did so. The problem is that, from my point of view, this option is not really able to cope with the global challenges we have. Uh, so we have to resort, from my point of view, to global governance, even if it means to weaken national sovereignty. Uh, and this is, from my point of view, and from the point of view of my federation, the clear uh, track we, we have to take. So we have, of course, strengthened supranational um, uh, cooperation governance in the European Union. And I hope that uh, 
uh, when we hopefully will have a, a, a government in Germany in some weeks uh, that we can restart it together with uh, France um, to really reform the European Union and to strengthen it, uh, supranational governance there. But also we have to reinforce WTO. This might sound a little bit naive as uh, the Trump administration seems to opt for a timeout in global governance, uh, but if is that so, then we have to talk to other partners um, uh, and test their willingness to develop, to bring forward global governance. governance. Might, might it be China, might it be Japan, India, African, Latin American countries? I think we, we have to do this, to do this effort and really to reinvest in, in, in global governance. Moreover, we have also to do some homework. I think we need, uh, especially in the European Union, a new consensus on trade policy. Um, we have, uh, in the past years, uh, I think, overloaded our uh, trade policy. Uh, uh, trade agreements have become more and more kind of basic treaties uh, with other governments, where we not only discuss trade, uh, but also investment, of course, but uh, labor standards, social standards, environment standards. So these are now really treaties hardly to negotiate, and, and to manage it at, at the end. And we have to rethink this. And we have to involve, of course, society, citizens on, on, on doing so. We as, as BDI started recently to do a series of town hall meetings on the future of trade policy. We will have not, some workshops with the critics of, uh, of, of TTIP and trade policy to, find, to try to find a new consensus on this. And the same, I think, is necessary for investment protection. Uh, we had a strong assistance in Europe against investment protection, but also many governments are about cancelling investment protection treaties because they find them unfair. So also we need to do more on this uh, to, to find a new consensus on that. Um, I think I, I stop here and, and leave it to the discussion to get a little bit deeper on some of the other issues. Thank you.